I'm Greg Shields from Audsley Learning and I'm here today with Dr. James Rucker. He's going to introduce himself. Hello, um, I'm James Rucker. I'm a senior clinical lecturer in psychopharmacology at King's College London and I'm also a consultant psychiatrist at the Maudsley Hospital uh, where I work at the Tertiary Referrals National Effective Disorder Service. Psychedelics like psilocybin have seen a resurgence in interest recently in particular in, within research in psychiatry and have shown some promise in the treatment of, of conditions like depression. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how these drugs might work to alter our mental states for therapeutic uses. Well, what we know about psilocybin and other psychedelics is that they uh, are partial agonists. That partial is important. Partial agonists of the two-way subtype of serotonin receptor. And that receptor is densely expressed in our cortex, particularly in bits of the cortex that we know are overactive in ruminatory states like depression and anxiety where people are overthinking a lot about uh, what's going on in their lives. So the effect of that partial agonism of the 2A receptor is to introduce a sort of loosening uh, of the neural architectures that are underpinning that ruminatory states and what you see in neuroimaging um, studies of people under the influence of psilocybin um, is a quietening of those overactive um, hubs, um, the cortex that seem to be overactive in depression. Um, what you also find is that people report this sense of um, what we would describe in psychiatry as ego dissolution. So this um, temporary suspension um, of our narrative sense of who we are, almost almost of our capacity to think verbally about ourselves and our world and get back to a slightly more primal form um, of immediate symbolic object awareness. And it's within that state that we wonder, and people wondered prior to 1970 when these drugs were made schedule one substances, we wonder whether the, um, there is a therapeutic window of opportunity and people are under the influence of this um, drug that introduces this, um, this state of this altered state of consciousness in which people may be more susceptible um, to, to influence because of this pharmacological loosening, more susceptible to influence in their thinking patterns. So within the right context, which is medically controlled and psychologically supported, inpatient environment, calm, um, warm, friendly. We think that particularly in people who are resistant to standard forms of um, treatment for depression, that there may be an opportunity um, to intervene with drugs like um, psilocybin. So that's what we're testing. We're testing single doses of psilocybin given in a safe and supportive inpatient environment with dedicated psychotherapeutic support alongside. And it's that context plus the drug that we are testing uh, at the moment in our clinical trials. So you're talking very much about using these psychoactive substances alongside psychotherapy and that those two things are paired in yeah. the treatment. Yeah, and, and, and that has historical precedent. So I like to think really that we're picking up the baton of history and and prior to 1970, um, when these drugs were quite widely used in psychiatry, I think that's been forgotten. Um, they were given in the context of an ongoing psychotherapeutic relationship intermittently. They were certainly not given daily, there'd be no point in giving them daily, um, but maybe every six weeks or three months or six months. Um, at points where therapist and patient agreed that they reached a block, uh, that there was, there was some sort of impasse. Um, where they needed to introduce something to something to sort of stir up, if you like, the snow globe of the mind, um, and see see how it's settled. So that's what we're doing now. We're inspired by history to look again at this paradigm of treatment with the benefits of modern trial design. Using psychedelics for uh, therapy for mental health is a topic that's come up in the media recently I think quite a lot and people are going overseas to try and seek these sorts of experiences for themselves. Do you think this reflects a change in the way society sees these substances? 
I think there's certainly a change in the air. Um, quite what has driven that is, is hard to say. Um, we're at the, well, it's been nearly 50 years since the introduction of the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act. Um, people are still using drugs. Um, so that's, there's a sort of societal realisation perhaps that prohibition doesn't stop people from using drugs. So then I think the question becomes, um, how do we use drugs? If they are tools, how do we use them? What are they good for? What are they bad for? Um, and clinical trials and scientific research is set up to do that. And I think we should be objectively curious about each drug that we can use and say, who is it good for? Who is it bad for? When should we use this? When should we not use it? I would say it is better to know that than to not to know at all about the drug. So there's that sense of a, of a change in the air and a sense of perhaps more open curiosity um, around where the drugs might sit in society and in, and, and in psychiatry. I think one of the other changes has been money. Before there was no money to do this sort of research grant funders wouldn't look at applications to do this sort of research and there was no commercial incentive. Now there is um, and I think that that reflects that change in the air um, and perhaps the capitalist society that we live in. You know, people have picked up on that change in the air probably they think there's some money to be made. The question from my point of view as a psychiatrist is how can we mould that process for the benefit of patients? Many psychedelic substances are still uh, classed as Class A drugs, despite showing little evidence of harm. What are the legal obstacles that get in the way of research or potential future application of these drugs in the treatment of uh, people with psychiatric disorders? So the class of a drug doesn't actually affect us as medical researchers. Um, the class of a drug determines the criminal sanctions um, that may be applied if someone is found in possession uh, or supplying those drugs. That doesn't affect us as researchers. What does affect us is the legal schedule. Uh, um, we'll all be um, aware of drugs that we have to write special forms of prescription for, like methadone or morphine. These are Schedule II drugs. They're legally denoted for medical use, but with certain restrictions surround security and safe custody of the drugs and how they're supplied. Psilocybin, along with all psychedelics and also cannabis until, um, until the year before last, is a Schedule I drug and that denotes it legally as not for medical use and that means um, that you cannot sign a prescription for it um, because it is legally impermissible to do so. Um, I have to have a special license in order to sign prescriptions for Schedule 1 drugs and every point in the manufacturing process for psilocybin has to have a separate Schedule 1 license issued by the Home Office. Those come with very burdensome security requirements. So that gives you an idea of um, the associated burdens and costs of doing research with drugs like this because ultimately the clinical trial process has to pay for that production process under these heavy burdens of security to get the drug to the patient. I think historically um, there hasn't been the money to pay for those sorts of trials but now with this slight change in the air um, there's commercial um, interest in psilocybin just as there has been with Prozac or, or, or tricyclics or antipsychotics. And this, I think, now is, is driving the research forward in a way that's, um, that, 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 that hasn't um, happened for many years. Um, from my point of view, I'm funded by the UK taxpayer, by the National Institute for Health Research, um, the Clinician Scientist Fellowship Programme. So that, I think, represents the change in the air too. Um, that sense that actually there's a UK um, taxpayer government funding body that's funding me to inquire into this area. So, to go back to your question, classes don't affect us, but the legal schedule does. Um, and because there's 
money to fund the trials now, we can begin to um, collect the evidence that might challenge that Schedule 1 status. And if we successfully show that psilocybin is a good treatment for resistant forms of depression, um, then in order for it to become a prescribable treatment, it will need to be taken out of Schedule 1. And at that point, it becomes prescribable a bit like um, like morphine would be, but probably with special restrictions about where it's prescribed and in what context it's, it's prescribed. What do you think the altered consciousness that people get when they take psychedelics can tell us about the experience and potentially the causes of mental illness? Well, you know, prior to 1970, when um, psychedelics were um, legally restricted, psychiatrists were encouraged to take them. They're encouraged to take them um, to understand um, the altered states of consciousness that their patients might be experiencing. Um, and I think the question for me is, is there value in that? Um, there are elements of our experience that are all our own and are all our patients' own because it's very hard for them to describe to us in a way that we can understand, really gets to the nub of what's going on for them. And I think there, um, psychoactive drugs have something to say. They have something to tell us. Um, and through the allied discipline of pharmacology and neuroscience, you can start to make inferences about what is biologically happening in the brains of people who are reporting these states of mind to us. And it also says something about our own conscious states and how they change. I think we're invested in the idea that somehow our, our conscious states stay the same throughout our lives, but they don't. They clearly don't. We go to sleep every day and you know, go into an altered state of consciousness. So I think for me there's a sense of how drugs like this can um, almost allow us to peer into the workings of our mind a bit. Um, there's a great fascination there for me. I think for many other people too. James, what would you say to people who are thinking of trying these substances or using these substances for therapeutic purposes but don't have access to them in a, in a formal sort of medical sense? Do you have any advice or words of wisdom for them? I can't recommend it to people because um, it's currently a, an illegal activity. But what we know from 50 years of prohibition is that doesn't stop people. So I think it then comes down to us as doctors um, to educate um, and to say, well, if you're going to do this, then how can you do it safely? Um, how can you do it in a way that minimises the harm, maximises the benefits? Now, I don't think at the moment that I can give anyone any words of wisdom about this. And the reason for that is the clinical trials are at early stage. But I think a more general um, a more general piece of advice is to seek out good sources of information about what you're going to be doing and to talk to others who have experience and that you trust um, and make sure you're in a safe place um, with access to help if you need it. I think if you, um, if you apply a few sort of common sense um, concepts um, you're going to put yourself in a much safer position than if you take it spontaneously, you know, in a place where you might not have access to help if things start to get difficult for you. And I think that it's in those contexts that historically we've seen where um, unpleasant things have happened. All drugs are tools. Um, they come with their uh, benefits and their pros and their cons. Um, and I think the question for us with psychedelics is, is how can we what is the context of delivery for those drugs that maximises the benefits and mitigates the risks? That's the nature of the research we're doing.